This is the Proton Guru video practice for topic 2.14. These problems will give you practice on acid cleavage of ethers. Some brief and straightforward reading to get you ready for these problems can be found in the Organic Chemistry 1 Primer 2018. You can also find additional chemistry videos and information on how to match those videos up with your course's textbook to help you in your course at ProtonGuru.com. We have a variety of ethers here with one equivalent of hydrobromic acid, and we are asked to provide the major product of the reaction. The general rule with these acid cleavage of ether reactions is that if an SN1 reaction is possible, you should do the fastest SN1 reaction. If not, you do the fastest SN2 reaction possible. So let's take a look at this first one. We have two potential sites for nucleophilic substitution once the acid protonates the oxygen to make it a good leaving group. Well, in this case, both of these potential sites are the same. It's a symmetric ether. Each side just has a propyl group on it. We have to say, well, is an SN1 reaction possible? No. If I tried to dissociate through heterolysis and make a carbocation, I would get a primary carbocation. The primary carbocation that's not stabilized by resonance isn't very stable. Very hard to do an SN1 reaction. So we're going to do an SN2 reaction in that case. If we think about the SN2 product, well, once this is a good leaving group and the bromide is a good nucleophile and comes in and attacks, you'll kick out one equivalent of propanol and one equivalent of bromopropane. Now this is with one equivalent of HBr. You don't have any more bromines or protons to protonate this, so the reaction would stop at that point. Let's take a look at the second example. Well, in this case we have a secondary site that could be attacked once we activate the oxygen and we have a primary site. SN1 is possible on the secondary site. We're going to do an SN1 reaction in this case. And it's this side that's going to be broken off as the carbocation and attacked by the bromide nucleophile. So we add the bromine to this site where the carbocation would initially form. And I've written down here that it's racemic because remember the SN1 reaction is stereo random. And now let's look at the final example on this page. We see a secondary site and a tertiary site. It's possible to do the SN1 reaction on either side. We want to do the fastest one. Remember that a tertiary carbocation will form more quickly than a secondary. So we're going to have the bromide eventually attacking that side once it comes off as a carbocation. So mechanistically we'd first protonate this. It would break off to form this alcohol. Then we would have this tertiary carbocation from this side and the bromide would coordinate to that to give you this alkyl bromide. Notice that since the nucleophile attacked the tertiary carbon, the other side, this carbon didn't change its bonding, it retained its configuration. So here's kind of a challenging question. We see this material. Remember that deuterium is just an isotope of hydrogen, so reactivity of the deuterium will be similar to if that was a hydrogen there. So we know that we should do an SN two reaction since each of these two sites are primary carbons. We have to be careful about the stereochemistry because SN2 leads to Walden inversion. We have two stereocenters. So we should first assign the configurations to the starting material to make sure we actually invert the configurations. Both of these are in the S configuration. The activation of the oxygen to be a good leaving group. The bromide will attack. It doesn't matter which side you attack because they're both S. You'll kick off, say, this half. You didn't attack this carbon that has the oxygen on it, so it keeps its initial configuration. And then you have the R configuration inverted for this product that was attacked by the nucleophile. First priority, second priority, third priority. The fourth priority is in the back, so you count one to two to three. That's in the R configuration. And here's another case. Provide the major product of this reaction. It's again an ether reacting in this case with an excess of hydrobromic acid. Now with an excess of hydrobromic acid, you could potentially do a reaction where you attack both sites to which the oxygen is attached, but let's think this through. We know that we would preferentially do the SN1 reaction. And the first thing we hopefully notice is that neither the SN1 nor the SN2 would work on this sp2 hybridized carbon. We can't attack that carbon with a nucleophile by either of those mechanisms. Well, is an SN1 reaction possible here? To deduce that, you would have to think about the mechanism where you turn this into a good leaving group and then break it off. If we did that, the carbocation that we would get would be this one. 
that is a resonance stabilized carbocation, and that is a perfectly good intermediate for an SN1 reaction. And then we have this species. Now, even though we have an excess of HBr, we could potentially protonate that, but we don't have a way to get the bromide to react with this species because neither SN1 nor SN2 will work on an sp2 hybridized carbon like that one. Well, now we can start to incorporate our knowledge of acid cleavage of ethers into these string problems, as we've seen in some of the more recent videos. So to address these types of problems, we try to figure out what kind of reaction is happening in each of these steps. Well, if we look at the first step, we see a good leaving group on a primary carbon, and the reactant has a good nucleophile once this ionic compound dissociates. That should be an SN2 reaction. We can't, without knowing what this material is in this box, can't really figure out what the HBr is going to do. We know a lot of different reactions that would use HBr as a reagent, so let's hold off on that for now. And just do the first step, where we do the SN2 reaction, where this negatively charged nucleophile displaces the chloride. Now we have an ether. Now we know that the HBr is needed to do acid cleavage of that ether. Since both of the potential sites for nucleophilic attack are primary, no resonance stabilization, we know that we can only do the SN2 reaction, not the SN1 reaction. And that will lead to ethanol and ethyl bromide as our products. Now this next part of our reaction string says we need to separate these two by distillation. We'll take the higher boiling point one up here and do this reaction, and take the lower boiling point down here and do this reaction. Remember that the boiling points are dictated by what type of intermolecular forces are present for similarly sized molecules. So there's hydrogen bonding in ethanol, this molecule, and hydrogen bonding is the stronger of the intermolecular forces compared to the dipole-dipole interactions that are present in a sample of ethyl bromide. Stronger intermolecular forces, higher boiling point. So it's the ethanol that we're going to carry through for this step. It's the ethyl bromide that's going to carry through for this bottom reaction. Well, we know that PCC is used to increase the oxidation state by one for the carbon to which the alcohol is attached. So we could take one of the hydrogens off of this alcohol and make a new bond to the oxygen, which will have to lose its hydrogen to accomplish that. Kind of think through and scribble on our scratch paper, that's probably what will happen. This reagent, if we draw it out, looks like this, dissociated from the potassium cation. Now that's really bulky because you've got these three branches here. That's not going to be a good nucleophile. But it is a very strong base, and that's the type of reagent you would need to do an E2 reaction. So now that we know what types of reactions we'll do in those two steps, we can say we do a single unit oxidation of the ethanol to form this aldehyde, and down here we make the alkene by doing the E2 reaction. 